All right, guys, this is your lesson about the different types of research design that we see in science. So I would encourage you at this point, put away um, anything that could distract you and do your best to focus in here. And please do take notes um, because you will be quizzed and tested on this. Okay, the first type of research design that we have is called descriptive research design. And typically, we see this sort of design um, when scientists discover um, new phenomenon or um, they want to study something um, a little bit more in depth eventually. So you may see things that are qualitative or quantitative, and we will discuss that in just a second. Um, typically, um, you'll see observation and descriptions of behavior of a subject, and there's no way that the scientist could influence um, the subject in any way. So maybe, um, for example, you go to the zoo and you watch the zebras or you watch the monkeys playing around, and um, if you were studying them and just observing and not going into their habitat and messing with them, that would be a descriptive research design. So, a little bit on qualitative versus quantitative. We've got qualitative and qualitative um, data and qualitative um, research may be things that are describing. So, sorry, that's sloppy. Ugh. Um, you may describe what the monkeys look like. You may look at their color, brown, red, bra black. Um, you may look at their size. So basically, the qualities. Okay? The qualities of what you're observing or what you're studying. Quantitative are going to be things like um, data. So if you are getting something that is measurable, you can measure it. You can take a ruler to it, you can weigh it. Things that basically give you numbers, those are quantitative um, descriptors, those are quantitative um, measurements. And typically you can run statistics on it. So you can get some stats, you can get some percentages, um, and study it through graphs. Okay? So, we take a look in descriptive research design at the where, the when, the what and the how, and those are things that can be investigated. So a few examples. What can the directors of the Coppell Nature Park do to naturally reduce the poison ivy population? Um, so those are things that you're going to study without um, interrupting the um, poison ivy population, but you're going to be able to just study, study that through description. And then lastly, where is cancer most frequently found? We can still get qualitative information or quantitative, but you're not actually going to these areas. You're just doing research and discovering um, the answer. And basically, descriptive research is a great way to help scientists or to help you um, kind of work through and kind of see what sort of experiments you want to do. Um, and then eventually, you can take those descriptions and turn them into other types of research and do experiments on them. So our second type of research design is called comparative research design. And with comparative, you're essentially comparing two different factors. And you're allowing yourself the chance to see if they are linked. If you do one thing, will something else occur? If something is this tall, will it weigh this much? Okay, so there's a link between the two factors that you're studying. And a lot of times we often use the term correlation to denote that there is a linkage. In comparative research design as well as experimental research design, we start to see different variables that we study. So for example, we have the independent variable. And you definitely want to make sure that you understand this because you will see it throughout the entire um, year of biology. An independent variable is something that is um, manipulated or changed, and it's independent of the results that you see in your experiment. And when we graph this, we put this on the x-axis. So if you don't remember the axes, you've got, right, x here, and this is your y. So we would put the independent variable on the x-axis. Okay? 
And your dependent variable is the one that um, is being observed as a result of the independent va variable being manipulated. So the independent variable is something that we manipulate and the dependent variable depends upon the independent variable. And that's kind of confusing, but we can review this tomorrow. And this one we typically graph on the y-axis. So if that was kind of confusing, you could pause, pause this, go back and watch it, and then we can also review tomorrow. So, for example, you've got your independent variable down here, the hour studied. That is what is manipulated, that you're able to manipulate. You can determine how many hours you study. And then you've got your dependent variable, the grade, on the y-axis. So the grade is a result of the hours studied, of what has been manipulated. So according to this graph, which we see a positive correlation, uh, the more hours you study, the higher your grade. Now, I don't know if that's really true. I, I don't think that's true. But uh, maybe you could do an experiment on that. A negative correlation you would see in the opposite direction. So when you're thinking of um, physics, you've got your pressure, which is the independent variable, right, the IV. And then your dependent variable is volume. So as the pressure increases, um, the volume will de decrease. So that's a negative correlation. And those are actually inversely proportional. So as one goes in one direction, the other is going to go in the opposite direction. And lastly, we have no correlation. Basically, you won't see any correlation between the two. So no matter how much time you spend watching TV in a week, it will never change the size of your TV. It will never change the size of your TV. Now, what if you change the size of your TV? What if we switched this? Okay, maybe it would uh, change the, si uh, the amount of time you watch TV in a week. Okay, so let me give you, um, let's look at the second example. Just pay attention to the second example. Basically, an example of this, a problem that you could ask is, what is the most responsive treatment of breast cancer? Removal of the entire breast or the removal of the tumor and the lymph nodes followed by radiation. So a lot of times if you look for this word or, you're gonna, that's going to give you a good hint that it's a comparative research. Okay, and remember, just because it correlates, it doesn't imply causation. So if I sing to a plant, then it grows. That isn't necessarily the case. So your end result is that you saw growth. So you saw a correlation between the, to between the two. You sang, you saw growth. But it doesn't necessarily mean that singing to a plant is going to cause the plant to grow. There's lots of other factors that cause a plant to grow. And the last one, this is basically the most powerful type of design, experimental research, because this one can actually help us determine the causation. So, and the reason why we can determine causation is because we actually have a control group, a group that doesn't get the manipulated variables um, attached to it, and we can compare to that control group. So, um, I shouldn't say prove here, sorry, I forgot to correct my... PowerPoint. This should say you can support, right? Ah. Ah. Okay. Support or disprove the hypothesis. And we can do this when we look at our evidence, when we look at our statistical data. Um, and we want to pay attention to qua uh, quantitative data, not qualitative data. We only want to pay attention to the numbers, the quantitative data, the things that can show us um, different manipulation. So, looking back at that correlation research design, um, what is the most responsive treatment of breast cancer? Um, we can basically turn this into an experimental um, type of um, design if we have a control group that was added that did not get the treatment. So we have a control group, no treatment, and then we have two other groups removing the entire breast or the removal of the tumor and the lymph nodes followed by radiation. And we can compare and see if there is any sort of correlation between the two. Okay, so with experimental research design, remember 
that these types of experiments must have a control group. If you see a control group, a group that doesn't have the variables um, uh, given to that, type, that group, um, then you know it's an experimental type of design. There has to be a variable that's tested that will reflect what you are studying, and you have to have a variable that can be measured accurately so that you can avoid um, different types of error as much as you can. And the most important thing with experiments is that they have to be able to be reproduced because that allows scientists to verify if um, your hypothesis is supported, if it's disproved, if this is something that we can consider a theory. Um, and that way, if you basically, if you were to call up another scientist and ask them to um, do your experiment, it should be able to be reproduced by someone else. Okay, and then a couple of advantages. Um, we see qualitative data, so that can give us much more accurate and precise information. There's little argument about these types of results because they're very objective. Um, they're, it's straight to the point because you've done an experiment. There's no room for your opinion or for someone else's opinion. And it's easy to replicate and validate the results. But a disadvantage to these types of experiments is that sometimes they don't represent the real, the real world because we can't um, do them on a grand scale. So sometimes you have to take parts of what you're studying and put them in a lab and not necessarily be able to do them on a full scale. So you'd be doing it as a model. And then lastly, real true experiments are very costly with um, you know, expensive equipment, um, precise um, instruments. Um, and so it, there's positive, positives and negatives, but I think that the advantages typically can weigh out the disadvantages.